RCA presents the first capacitance video disc player for interactive viewing. This disc was designed to allow you to demonstrate and experiment with the various interactive capabilities of this unique new disc player. It'll take you through each of the player's features and introduce you to a new type of program that you can interact with. Now, the unique feature of interactive viewing is that you control the way in which you view the material on the disc. You can set your own pace, select the segments you want, and program your own viewing sequence. Right now, you're looking at the main menu. As you can see, it's basically a table of contents that tells you how to select the band you want to view. This particular menu gives you three options. Your first option is the keypad exercise segment. This is a linear segment that allows you to demonstrate and exercise the basic keypad functions. Your second option is the special function segment. This segment contains a series of bands illustrating the more complex programming functions. Last but not least is the tennis tip segment. This segment contains a number of different tennis bands so that you can practice what you've learned about the programming functions and create your own combinations or strings of bands. Whenever you arrive at a menu frame, you also have the opportunity to check your location on the disk. Simply press play after each menu and the appropriate status page will appear. Status pages contain a flowchart on the disk content with a highlight at your present location. When you want to return to the menu, press Page and Reverse. Or to continue with the program, press Play again. Another menu is also provided at the end of each band. This is often referred to as an escape menu. It provides additional instructions and an escape path back to the main menu. To maximize the interactive design of this disk, each decision point has a built-in stop code. When you come to a red dot, you'll know it's your cue to make a decision. The menu at each stop code presents you with choices. How you proceed through the disk depends on which option you choose. So, if you're ready to get into the program, select a choice from this main menu, or press play, and you'll come to the first status page. First thing we want to consider is how do we hold the racket? What is the grip? And briefly, I would say that there's no one grip that everyone should use. But the most comfortable grip, and if you're a beginner, the one you probably would want to use when you first start, is called the Eastern grip, or basically a shake hands grip, where you bring your hand down the racket and literally just shake hands with it, as if that were someone else's hand. It's a very comfortable, relaxed position. You always want to be relaxed on every stroke you hit. But it's hard to say that that's the grip you should use. And if you go watch a professional tournament and you watch 12 different players, you'll see 12 different grips, varying from the Eastern to a Continental in between or to a Western, where they literally are around the racket in order to hit topspin. So it, it basically, the, the key word is comfort. Whatever is most comfortable for you as an individual is the best way to hold the racket. There are certain elements to, to the forehand, and basically they are one, preparation, two, transfer of weight from the back foot to the front foot, three, where you want to meet the ball, and four, the follow through. Now, how do we go from step to step? Well, basically, if you're in your ready position and your knees are slightly flexed at all times so that you can move right or left, and we're facing the net ready for the ball, and we see the ball coming to the forehand, the backswing should start so you have plenty of time to bring the racket forward. A common problem 
is that people don't get the racket back soon enough. They wait for the ball to hit on their side of the court, and then everything is one quick motion, and they don't really have the time to set up. So the most important thing is get the racket back early. There's several ways to bring the racket back. One is straight back, which saves a little bit of time. When I was a six years old and learning to play tennis, I learned what we called the capital C, which is a little circular motion, like you're making a C with your racket. Obviously, that takes more time to get the racket from here to here than if you take it straight to here. So you have to prepare even earlier. But preparation is the key word. Now, if we can get the racket back, and we turn the shoulders. Very important to always try to be perp perpendicular to the net. It, sometimes it's obviously impossible to, if you're hitting the ball on the run to get the feet turned, but the important thing is to always turn the shoulders. And the difficult thing on the forehand is that you have to tell yourself to turn the shoulders. Whereas on the backhand, to take your racket back, you have to turn the shoulders. Everything is done automatically. That's why the backhand is a more natural stroke. The forehand is an unnatural stroke because you're coming across your body in an unnatural way. So if we've got to tell ourselves to turn the shoulders, and you've got to keep them turned as you swing, it's very natural. This is the common fault. It's very natural as you swing. Pull your body. Make it go this way. That, that thing you're going to lose control of the shot. So try to keep the shoulders turned until the stroke is finished. Like in golf, you keep your head down. Everything stays. It's the same in tennis. Tennis, golf, and baseball are all very similar. The head stays still, the body stays turned. And the most important thing in all three of these sports is, is proper transfer of the weight from the back foot to the front foot. The forward motion starts as the ball is coming across to your side of the net. And as the ball hits, your racket should be coming forward. Now, the common fault with, with transfer of the weight is that most people panic. They get a little bit too excited about what they're doing, and they, they get the racket back, and they step forward and then they swing. Basically, all the pace you want should come from your weight, not from your arm. It's not how hard you swing at the ball, but it's how well you time the transfer of your weight into the ball. So all this should be happening at the same time. The racket comes forward, the weight comes forward, and you meet the ball as you're moving forward, not after you've stepped forward. Now, when we transfer the weight, Contact should be made at a point about even with the front foot. As you step in, the ball should be hit right there. Now, another problem that all players have, whether they're club players or professionals, is hitting the ball either too far away from the body or too close to the body. And if you hit the ball too close, you just you really don't see the ball as well. My father used to tell me when I was a little kid, I didn't know anything about physics, but he always said, that if you see a truck in the distance, it doesn't appear to be moving very fast. And it's the same in tennis. Even though it's a, maybe a distance of 12 inches, you actually see the ball seems to be moving slower at a point out here than it is in here. You can see the ball clearer and better away from your body than in close. But then how far away from the body is the next question. The arm should never be completely straight. The elbow should be slightly bent but a nice relaxed bend of the elbow, not tucked in. Again, we go back to golf and baseball, and we want to always think about keeping the head completely still. If your head stays down, your whole body stays down. If your head comes up, your whole body comes up. And that's when you lose control is when you pull off of the ball. So if we can keep the head still, right at that point, if it's always looking at that point where we want to make contact, right there, and then just let the racket do the work. Now, one real big error that everyone makes is what do they do with the other hand? And I've improved my forehand considerably in the last few years by actually pointing to that spot where I think I should be hitting the ball every time. The final thing, which is very important on all strokes in tennis, but on the forehand, is the follow through. Now, where? What do we do with the racket after the ball leaves strings? It's a nice, easy, flowing stroke. The follow-through is across the body. Not straight up, but the common fault that most players have is that they hit the ball and they stop the swing right there. The follow-through is what gives the ball direction and which carries the ball over the net. Now, I've found that 
to help my forehand personally, I've tried to actually bring my, I'm right-handed, I bring my right shoulder under my chin. It helped me to really hit right through the ball and a nice straight follow through, right under the chin. It also keeps my head down. Now we'll go through the whole stroke one time. From the ready position with the knees slightly bent, I see the ball coming to my forehand and I immediately start my preparation. Both hands are working. It's not just one hand, you see. It's very important if you're right-handed to use your left hand and if you're left-handed to use your right hand. It helps the balance. Balance is very important. So we get prepared. The shoulders turn first and the hips. Shoulders and the hips go together. I see the ball coming. My racket comes back to here. My feet turn sideways to the net. And then as the ball comes, I step forward and meet the ball at a position even with my front foot. And a nice, easy, flowing motion right through the ball, across the body, follow through high, and back to the ready position. If you can think about preparation, weight transfer, keeping the head down, making contact in front of the body, nice, easy stroke, and a good follow through, I think you'll find your forehand will improve tremendously. Once you feel comfortable with the basic techniques of the forehand and feel that you've mastered it and become a slightly advanced player, there's really three other ways you can think about hitting your forehand. And one is to hit it flat. Two is to put a little bit of topspin on the ball, which we see so much of today in the professional game. And three is to come under the ball, what's called underspin. On these three strokes, the flat forehand, the topspin forehand, and the underspin forehand, Two things to think about first. One is the grip stays the same. You don't have to try to use a different grip to hit topspin or underspin or flat. And two is that on all strokes in tennis, the wrist should always be firm. A lot of people, especially on topspin, think that the way they get topspin is to turn the arm over or break the wrist, and that's the wrong idea. The wrist should always be firm in tennis. Tennis is not squash. It's not racquetball where you use a lot of wrist wrist always firm. Now, to hit the ball flat, the ball is coming to me. The idea is to come straight through the ball on the same plane, straight through it. The ball's at this plane, the racket comes from this plane, and they meet head on. The racket face is completely closed, and it comes straight through the ball. Now, if we remember the flat forehand, we came straight through the ball. Now, from the same plane, but on top spin, the racket starts below the ball and comes up over. It's called a sweeping motion, but we don't turn the wrist over and don't turn the arm over. Now, what top spin does, it turn, the ball turns over more. If it goes flat, it might, it might not turn at all, but with top spin, it turns, and you'll see that the ball will go high over the net and then dip, let you hit the ball hard, but still keep the ball in the court. Now, the third shot is underspin, which is used very rarely. And the idea is you start actually above the ball, and the face of the racket is, is open, whereas on the flat shot, it was closed. We come under the ball, from behind it again, and the ball spins the other way. It spins this way, whereas with top spin, it spun the other way. You come under the ball, carries the ball deep, but the ball stays low. Recapping, in the flat forehand, we come straight through the ball. The head of the racket is closed. Top spin, the head is open, but it comes from below the ball, and you brush up over the ball, and the ball spins, and it gives you control. Under spin, the head is open again, but it comes from above the ball, and the ball spins, turns the other way, and that keeps the ball low. Top spin, the ball bounces high. Under spin, the ball bounces low.
keys to hitting a good backhand smash are, first of all, you want to get sideways, just like you did on the other side. Get your racket back here in a very high position. And also, get your weight back so that you can transfer your weight as you hit the ball, so that your weight will be going forward, your arm will be going forward, and of course, as you hit it, your wrist will be going forward. Another advantage that you'll have as you hit the two-handed backhand is on the passing shot because you not only get the natural top spin by virtue of dropping the racket head down lower than you do on a one-handed backhand, but you also get a lot of side spin because of the action of your left hand on the racket. And it also means that as a two-handed backhand player, you're going to be playing more to the side of the court than to the length of the court means you're going to try to take your opponent out wide, out farther even than the double alley, to get him out of the court, and then on the next shot, open up the entire court for the put-away shot. One of the most important features of this player is its ability to organize the content of the disc into specific categories of material. Discs can be designed with up to six bands, which can be sorted or interactively accessed in a number of different ways. This sorting ability is accomplished through the selection of different groups of bands. For example, if you have viewers with different proficiency levels using this, you can create separate bands for beginning, intermediate, or advanced students. Viewers can select the segments that match their particular needs. They can repeat segments until they're mastered or skip to more advanced levels at whatever pace they find comfortable. Starting with that grip of the forehand, when the hand and your wrist was literally behind the racket like this, in order to get the backhand grip, we have to move the hand now more on top of the racket, from the side to the top. And we start by putting the bottom part, the fleshy part of the palm, literally on top of the racket at the base of the handle right here. Spread your fingers over as much of the handle as possible and have the V formed by your thumb and this first finger straddling the top left edge of the handle. And on the other side, the thumb, the base of the thumb, the tips of these four fingers. And the thumb rests between the middle finger and the forefinger. Until you are a competent player, you should continuously check your grip until it becomes second nature to you. Flipping it around in your hand until you can just get the backhand grip automatically. There are three parts to the backhand. The backswing, the follow through, and the finish. The key to a successful backhand stroke is early preparation. And the first thing you want to do instantaneously when you see the ball coming to your backhand side is to bring the racket back with your left hand while pivoting on your left foot. Watch my heel and my left shoulder. Then we look at the distance the racket travels between the knee and the shoulder on the end of the backswing. No higher than the shoulder, no lower than the knee. Now there are two ways to get the racket back in this position. You can loop it like this, or you can bring it straight back like this. Either way, you want to use the left hand to guide you. 
The second part of the backhand is the follow through. This is where most of you get in trouble. You first want to think about transferring your weight. The index finger is your follow through. It's open, it's open, it's open. And when you finish the follow through, it leads to the finish. Now, the flat backhand, since flat means no spin, and it's virtually impossible to hit a ball like that, when you hear of flat strokes, what is meant are really strokes with very little spin. If you're going to hit a properly executed, perfectly flat shot, the ball must hit the strings of your racket exactly 90 degrees, and it must continue on in that plane until the ball leaves the strings. Remember, shots hit with very little spin are hard to control. The critical element in trying to hit a topspin backhand is timing. And timing with the topspin backhand is very difficult because whereas with the underspin backhand, the head of the racket is open throughout the entire stroke itself. With the topspin backhand, the head of the racket is closed Generally, the idea in the back of your mind when executing a topspin backhand is that you want to throw the racket at the ball. You want to imagine in your head, at least, that the racket is loosely held in your hand and that you are slinging the racket at the ball. Most of the world's great topspin backhand players started with a low backswing. When they are at the end of their backswing, the head of the racket is usually below the waist or, at the most, below the wrist. The path of the racket head is low to high, so that you can brush up against the ball opposite your right foot as you execute your follow-through. The follow-through has to be more pronounced than the follow-through on the underspin backhand. Try to make the follow-through as far forward as possible, as opposed to straight up in the air. The ball tends to fall shorter in the court when you hit a topspin backhand. The more you follow through, the more distance you'll get. The program key, when used in conjunction with the band key, provides another important interactive feature of this player. That is, users can virtually create their own programs by stringing up to five bands in the sequence of their choice. For example, one can access the bands in the Tennis Tip segment by Tennis Pro or by Tennis Technique. So, the same disc can be seen in any number of ways by users with different needs or skills. You know, there's a lot of important things you got to have to be a good tennis player. But one of the most important, in my opinion, is to have a good grip. And the reason I say that is through the years, I've seen all the good players who have good sound strokes come up with a good grip as well. Number one, we go to the Western grip. And the Western grip was named because back in the old days in tennis, the balls used to bounce very, very high, particularly on the concrete courts out in California. So people developed this kind of a grip to handle high balls and the hand was directly under the handle of the racket. And it is good for high balls, but if you move to a situation where you have to hit low balls as well, really this grip doesn't work. You also have a problem with the backhand. Moving around to what we think is the more conventional way to hold the racket, a lot of good players do it, not necessarily all of them, but we call it the shake hands grip or hitting the ball with the palm of your hand. This is the Eastern grip. You simply slide your hand down to where it's comfortable on the handle. And the key thing to remember is the top of the handle 
has two bevels. The bevel on the right side forms the V between the index and the thumb finger. This is a very fine grip and it's very, very good for low balls or high balls. You can do anything with that particular grip. Moving over on top a little further, we come to the Continental Grip. The Continental Grip was developed by the English because their game was predominantly played on grass, and they found that hitting low balls, because on grass they're skiddy and low, that a little bit of a flick of the wrist using this kind of a grip was very, very successful for them. The one good thing about the Continental Grip is it's identified by the V switching from the eastern side on the top right half of the handle to the left bevel. The V is formed by the thumb and the forefinger over here. I was saying one great thing about the Continental Grip is that it is practically the same grip that you'd use for a backhand. And so this is the grip that if you're going to be a single grip player using the same grip for the forehand and the backhand, you should use this kind of a grip. It's a good one. First thing we want to consider is how do we hold the racket? What is the grip? And briefly, I would say that there's no one grip that everyone should use. But the most comfortable grip, and if you're a beginner, the one you probably would want to use when you first start, is called the Eastern Grip, or basically a shake hands grip, where you bring your hand down the racket and literally just shake hands with it, as if that were someone else's hand. It's a very comfortable, relaxed position. You always want to be relaxed on every stroke you hit. But it's hard to say that that's the grip you should use. And if you go watch a professional tournament and you watch 12 different players, you'll see 12 different grips, varying from the Eastern to a Continental in between or to a Western, where they literally are around the racket in order to hit topspin. So it, it basically, the, the key word is comfort. Whatever is most comfortable for you as an individual is the best way to hold the racket. So far, we've been talking about the various grips for the forehand, but there is a, a change necessary for you to produce a good backhand, unless, however, you are that continental grip player where the forehand and the backhand can practically be the same grip. The reason it's necessary from the eastern forehand or the western forehand to make a grip change is to get some help mainly from your thumb. I'm going to demonstrate something that will show you what I mean. If you're in an eastern forehand grip, which is like this, and you tried to hit the backhand, you would see that there's very, very little help, no thrust at all, because the wrist is broken, it's limp. And I'd like to suggest something, that if you turn this over, you turn it into a judo cut. So simply, turn that knuckle of the forefinger away from this side of the racket to this side, which forms the V. Immediately, you get some extra help from the thumb on the back side. Now, you don't have to use the thumb the way I'm demonstrating here because it can get help this way, and you can have it overlapped, and a lot of players do that. A lot of good players are a little further around here. They tend to sort of push the ball, but somewhere in between there, try to get some help from that thumb. It's very valuable for your backhand. With that grip forehand, when the hand and your wrist was literally behind the racket like this, in order to get the backhand grip, we have to move the hand now more on top of the racket, from the side to the top. And we start by putting the bottom part, the fleshy part of the palm, literally on top of the racket at the base of the handle right here. Spread your fingers over as much of the handle as possible and have the V formed by your thumb and this first finger straddling the top left edge of the handle. And on the other side, the thumb Place of the thumb, the tips of these four fingers. And the thumb rests between the middle finger and the forefinger. Until you are a competent player, you should continuously check your grip until it becomes second nature to you. Flipping it around in your hand until you can just get the backhand grip automatically. Some of the more general mechanics about the two-handed backhand, uh, starting with the grip, most of the players use an eastern backhand. 
and then the top, the left hand comes over just naturally. This enables a natural swing to be from very low up to very high. The footwork that's involved here is very important. It means that you have to have much quicker operation because you don't have the reach. The top players that are playing in the game now take very small steps. And so when you're growing up or when you're starting to use it, you have to remember you have to be moving awfully well and get that preparation of the racket back very quickly. Now I'd like to talk about a few of the technical points about the smash. First of all, the grip. You want to use a grip which is just like your service grip, which is a continental grip. Now, most of you hit a forehand with this grip with a V between your thumb and your forefinger right on top of the grip. Well, for the continental grip, you want to move that V one turn to the left so that your hand is more on top of the racket and you have a little bit more of your hand behind the racket as you're coming through to hit the serve. Once you go with the basic techniques of the forehand and feel that you've mastered it and become a slightly advanced player, there's really three other ways you can think about hitting your forehand. And one is to hit it flat. Two is to put a little bit of topspin on the ball, which we see so much of today in the professional game. And three is to come under the ball, what's called underspin. On these three strokes, the flat forehand, the topspin forehand, and the underspin forehand, Two things to think about. First, one is the grip stays the same. You don't have to try to use a different grip to hit topspin or underspin or flat. And two is that on all strokes in tennis, the wrist should always be firm. A lot of people, especially on topspin, think that the way they get topspin is to turn the arm over or break the wrist, and that's the wrong idea. The wrist should always be firm in tennis. Tennis is not squat, it's not right where you use a lot of wrist. The wrist is always firm. Now, to hit the ball flat, the ball is coming to me. The idea is to come straight through the ball on the same plane, straight through it. The ball's at this plane. The racket comes from this plane, and they meet head on. The racket face is completely closed, and it comes straight through the ball. Now, if we remember the flat forehand, we came straight through the ball. Now, from the same plane, but on top spin, the racket starts below the ball and comes up over it. It's called a sweeping motion, but we don't turn the wrist over and don't turn the arm over. Now, what top spin does, it turn, the ball turns over more. If it goes flat, it might, it might not turn at all. But with top spin, it turns, and you'll see that the ball will go high over the net and then dip, let you hit the ball hard, but still keep the ball in the court. Now the third shot is underspin, which is used very rarely. And the idea is you start actually above the ball, and the face of the racket is, is open, whereas on the flat shot, it was closed. We come under the ball, from behind it again, and the ball spins the other way. It spins this way, whereas with top spin, it spun the other way. You come under the ball, carries the ball deep, but the ball stays low. Recapping, in the flat forehand, we come straight through the ball. The head of the racket is closed. Top spin, the head is open, but it comes from below the ball, and you brush up over the ball. And the ball spins, and it gives you control. Under spin, the head is open again, but it comes from above the ball, and the ball spins, turns the other way, and that keeps the ball low. Top spin, the ball bounces high. Under spin, the ball bounces low. Now, I separate the finish and the follow-through for one big reason. I want you to think of swinging through the ball, not at the ball. Swing through the ball. And when you do finish, the back of your hand is pointing toward the sky. What I've just described to you is the basic underspin backhand. It's my bread and butter shot, as it is for most of the other players. And with this shot, 
You can float the ball deep back to your opponent's court with a minimum of effort. It's the easiest backhand to execute, and it's the most versatile. You can hit the ball anywhere in the court. The critical element in trying to hit a topspin backhand is timing. And timing with the topspin backhand is very difficult because whereas with the underspin backhand, the head of the racket is open throughout the entire stroke itself, with the topspin backhand, the head of the racket is closed. Generally, the idea in the back of your mind when executing a topspin backhand is that you want to throw the racket at the ball in your head, at least, that the racket is loosely held in your hand and that you are slinging the racket at the ball. Most of the world's great topspin backhand players started with a low backswing. When they are at the end of their backswing, the head of the racket is usually below the waist or, at the most, below the wrist. The path of the racket head is low to high so that you can brush up against the ball opposite your right foot as you execute your follow-through. The follow-through has to be more pronounced than the follow-through on the underspin backhand. Try to make the follow-through as far forward as possible as opposed to straight up in the air. The ball tends to fall shorter in the court when you hit a topspin backhand. The more you follow through, the more distance you'll get. Putting it all together, you need to have a good ready position. You need to get the racket back before the ball bounces. You want to keep that head still, and you need good balance, and you need to let the racket head do the work. Now we'll go through the whole stroke one time. From the ready position with the knees slightly bent, I see the ball coming to my forehand and I immediately start my preparation. Both hands are working. It's not just one hand, you see. It's very important if you're right-handed to use your left hand, and if you're left-handed to use your right hand. It helps the balance. Balance is very important. So we get prepared. The shoulders turn first, and the hips. Shoulders and the hips go together. I see the ball coming. My racket comes back to here. My feet turn sideways to the net, and then as the ball comes, I step forward and meet the ball, at a position even with my front foot. And a nice, easy, flowing motion right through the ball, across the body, follow through high, and back to the ready position. If you can think about preparation, weight transfer, keeping the head down, making contact in front of the body, nice, easy stroke, and a good follow through, I think you'll find your forehand will improve tremendously. Well, that's the backhand. Now remember these two keys to a successful backhand. First, early preparation. Get that racket head back as soon as you see the ball coming. And secondly, remember to hit through the ball, not at the ball. Recapping, in the flat forehand, we come straight through the ball. The head of the racket is closed. Top spin, the head is open, but it comes from below the ball, and you brush up over the ball, and the ball spins and it gives you control. Under spin, the head is open again, but it comes from above the ball, and the ball spins, turns the other way, and that keeps the ball low. Top spin, the ball bounces high. Under spin, the ball bounces low. <laughs>